live from Palo Alto, California, it's The Cube at Pier 2.0. Brought to you by the Pier 2.0 Foundations. Learn, connect, and grow. Now here are your hosts, John Furrier and Jeff Frick. Hey, welcome back everyone here live in Silicon Valley in Palo Alto. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier with Jeff Frick here at Pier 2.0 conference, getting all the data around all the networks, all the action. And our next guest is Yad Ali Khan, Director, Network Engineering at LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn, um, one of the big three I call them in social networks. Obviously, you know, you got Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn, all really demonstrating huge success in the marketplace. Um, also a big fan of LinkedIn and theCUBE. We've, We've been to pretty much every Hadoop world since existence, so we know their, their prolific use of data, real time, um, and so they got to have the networks to support it. Uh, Zaid, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. Appreciate it. Great to have tech athletes on like yourself who are, you know, you're running the plumbing for all the action for LinkedIn, right? So, so is it stressful? <laughs> <laughs> it is, yes, it's, it's, but it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you got a big smile on your face, yeah. <laughs> a smile of nervousness. Yeah. I can only imagine the pressure, I was a huge, yeah. Success story, Silicon Valley, but you know the, the growth has been well documented. It obviously went public, uh, earnings are doing well. But what kind of rocket ship was that like? And describe for the folks out there the challenges that you had to go through. One, to standing up all those networks. The, how, just what was it like? And just give some color. You don't have to give any secrets, but like give us a taste of what it was like. Well, you know, a lot of it was around growth when I when I joined about three and a half years ago. The company was already formed and, and, and growing a lot of products. Uh, and I think that the, the biggest challenge was, you know, how do you scale this, right? How do you meet the, the amount of, you know, uh, hundreds of millions of users that we were scaling to? Um, so so the, 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 the challenge was keeping up, uh, you know, the, the growth and, and making sure that your networks were stable and the site was always up. Uh, so that was uh, a lot of the work, uh, still is a lot of the work. Uh, we're growing users every day, so there's a lot of uh, uh, challenges there. Um, but uh, it's, it's fun building networks at scale. Jeff, what's your take on LinkedIn? I mean, you, you, you've seen their growth. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan and uh, I think it's a phenomenal application. But Dan, I'm curious in terms of on, on that growth, I know there's a lot of uh, like constant innovation inside of LinkedIn trying mm -hmm. to develop new apps and push out new functionality. Are, are you guys big enough now where things have kind of smoothed out in terms of the, of the growth rate or is it still kind of lumpy based on you know, pushing out new features or pushing out new things from within inside the company? Oh, we're always pushing out new features. We are growing a lot of users, uh, so that that's keeps the momentum going. Uh, it's never slowed down, so we're, we're constantly sending new users and, and growing the network to meet it. And also and the international uh, expansion, I think, is, has been uh, dramatically yeah. increased over the yep. last several years. So yep. speak a little bit about kind of yeah, unique challenges as you increase your, your global uh, user base. Sure, we, we have uh, you know users all over the world. Uh, and every geographical region has a, a unique challenge uh, from sort of uh, making sure that we deliver content fast, and uh, and so we, you know, how do we build our networks to sustain that? So we care a lot about that. We we go into different markets and and, and build our networks to reach eyeballs as fast as possible, uh, and and deliver content quickly. So so that that is a, a fun and exciting challenge. Yeah. So talk about the uh, peering conference here, it's mm -hmm. about openness, a lot of education in the foundation here, first event. Um, the network community is pretty tight, you pretty much the guys at the scale levels that you guys are talking about are, yeah. it's a small community and it's growing, but a lot of new blood's coming in. You have a lot of young guns, the DevOps mindset yep. is pretty much part of that culture uh, of the new, the, new, the new guard, if you will. What is the big conversation happening right now in the community, and why is it important for companies to get involved? Well, I, I think, uh, 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 John, a lot of it is is that uh, the ecosystem is changing, right? Before you you just go in and buy transit, and and you just don't care, like the internet just happens for you, right? But as you build uh, more content out there, you want uh, you want to deliver these things really fast, right? So 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 the entire sort of ecosystem is is changing, and so you have a lot of people coming in inquiring about, you know, hey, how do I how do I do peering? How do I actually connect two networks so that 
uh, I, I don't have to go through the congested internet. So that is, uh, we're seeing a lot of that. Uh, and it's fun to see a lot of people come to this conference, you know, curious about it, uh, to see how other people do it to learn. Uh, so it's been really So is it a roll your own market right now in terms of networks? I mean, that kind of saw that with the data centers and hosting. People were kind of saying, hey, I, don't, I can just have them host my own, have my own data center. Mm -hmm. uh, that kind of roll your own concept. Is that what we were talking about here? People say, hey, I want to bypass the congestion. I want to build my own routes. Is that what's happening? Well, people, people, are, people care about their applications a lot, right? They want to they wanna be in control. So, so how do you be in control? You, you, you get involved as much as possible. You don't leave anything to you know, a particular vendor. So people want to appear because they want to control uh, the packets going from their network to another network or reaching their eyeballs. So, so this is all about making sure that in the end of the day, you know, you're building your application um, to a certain level where you're in control of it end to end. And then peering is a huge part of that. And what's the challenge before and after? You have to look at, you know, before peering, open peering, to after the ideal state. Is it how much pain is? Is it pain relief? Is it an aspirin? Is it steroids? I mean, what do you get for this? I mean, what's the value? Uh, so the value is is you know comes down to a lot of it. Uh, you know, from our side, it's uh, you know a faster performing site, right? So so at the end of it you are improving your site performance. And that's generally what the content companies do. They want to get into peering uh, so that they can uh, deliver that content fast. So in the end of the day, uh, it's not just a little aspirin relief, it's actually you know, long-term relief because you actually uh, have control of these bits and how you move them around. It's just competitive advantage at that point. Yes, yeah. Competitive as well as you know, um, uh, you know whatever you, you can call it competitive, or you could just say you know you know user you experience. Are, yeah, user experience. Exactly. It's all about the users at the end of the day. So talk about real time because mm -hmm. this is something that's come up. Um, obviously, the uh, Vio yeah. is on here talking there. Obviously, real time. They still pump it up. You can't go anywhere these days without talking about mobile. Um, yeah. And you guys have a great mobile app, and you know, just a lot, lot with big data. Real time is real time. <laughs> it means like latency is an issue, right? Yeah. So how do you guys? Latency is obviously something that network guys are used to. How does that factor in when you have an application-driven marketplace that's going on now, where people are really looking at the application-centric view down into the network? Latency is a big issue, but how does that impact the real time for the end user experience? What are you seeing? Are, are the issues around real time? What going to make it better, faster, uh, easier? Well, building better networks, right? Uh, building better networks, connecting to as many networks make uh, the real-time piece real-time. So, as real-time as you can get. Uh, so, so what, what's happening is basically networks are connecting much more tighter with each other, not relying on you know upstreams or, or various other third parties. They're just going down to the core of the net, core of the internet, and just saying, let's connect at the core. And when you connect more at the core, that is where you get near real time um, exchange. So See, talk a little bit about the conversations when you're setting up a peering relationship. Mm -hmm. So if it's, if it's a content provider to a content provider and they've got different types of content, it seems pretty uh, equitable probably if you're of similar size like yeah. and, and traffic. But right. what if there's a disparity there? Um, how does that negotiation go? How are you assigning value? How are you trading value or is it just, um, you know, we're all in this together yeah. and we just want to deliver better yeah. performance. How are those conversations? Uh, so you mean between two content providers? Well, between two content providers yeah. or a content provider and not a content yeah. provider. So as you said, the, the, the ecosystem is changing and where before it was kind of the tier one providers yeah. appearing or the tier yeah. two providers. Now you guys are, right. are, are doing it directly with other content providers and right. other, other yeah. uh, folks. So how's that, sure. how's that kind of value established that, that enables you then to put together a good relationship and a good uh, arrangement? Okay, so I'll first talk about the content to content. So content to content providers, they're very open to peer with each other because it's mutually beneficial. There's really no argument. Um, uh, because you know there's API information or, or they're sending emails to each other or whatever. It's just the two content providers just naturally form a marriage, right? It's easy, no no problem. Where it gets a little bit complicated is you know when when ISPs and, and content providers you know want to actually peer with each other. Some of them are strictly like you know no, I would just you know you have to buy from us and, and that's that's their stance. There are many that actually are a little bit more open. They they're they're. Uh, um, they, they see the value in, in it, right? So if you're a, a, a heavy content provider and you have access to a lot of networks, uh, one thing to note is the transit price has gone down over time. Uh, so it's really, really cheap. So, so why do you want to charge a content provider so much 
uh, money for it, whereas you know that at the end of the day, you're going to make that money off the access people. So you benefit from peering with content providers so that in the end of the day, you provide better performance to access networks. So that is actually a value that many providers see from themselves. And those are the ones that see the value in the relationship with content providers and so openly peer with them. Okay. And that is actually beneficial for their business at the end of the day because they actually do uh, make, uh, you know, they can s deliver the content a lot faster. They, they, in the end of the day, their users are happier. They will not leave their networks right. uh, and, and stay on with them. So it's, it's a mutual win and win. Yeah, so basically the value of the content has increased yeah. so much and then the, yeah. the, the revenue opportunity on the transit has decreased so much that they've, yeah. kind, of, they've kind of passed now. It's just much right. more yeah. uh, logical to go ahead and do that period relationship. So at the end of the day, you're getting the money down yeah. at the other end of, yeah. the, uh, of the pipe. Exactly. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So what's next on networks? Obviously virtualization has a huge impact on it. We, you know, we cover, we'll be covering VMworld coming up for our fifth year now. And, and uh, you know, Paul Moritz laid out his vision you know, five years ago, now he's at Pivotal. You know, essentially the main software mainframe is the cloud. And the network has always been kind of the last stomping ground to really get tweaked and seeing, you know, it's actually moving down the stack versus it used to be saying everyone's going to move up the stack in the old, old, old conversation, you know. Now that's happened. Now all the force is coming down the network. Uh, SDN has been a big hyped up area, mm -hmm. software defined data center. How is all that, those, those drivers changing networking? Is it forcing behavior change, some technology change? Can you comment on that? Yeah, sure. So I actually just gave a talk on, on peering automation and, 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 and the way we look at it at, at, at LinkedIn and a lot of content companies like us are doing is uh, the role of the network engineer is changing. Um, uh, before it used to be a network engineer getting on a, on a piece of routing equipment and, and typing away at the CLI and making you know routing changes, you know real core engineering kind of stuff. They feel good at it at the end of the day, uh, but that is not the best use of an engineer. Uh, an engineer should be spending more time writing code to manipulate these devices. So these devices now um, have gone to a stage where they've become far more sophisticated. So the trend is actually going towards. Uh, writing software to manipulate the changes. So the, the network engineer is spending more time, or in the future will be spending more time, uh, having to shift away from the mentality of, of getting on the router and, 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 and writing uh, and making these changes as opposed to and then moving to like actually writing code to make it. It's a better use of that time. It's uh, more challenging, more, uh, it's more innovative, um, and, and it's the future. The old days, we used to say, I used to do a lot of network stuff, the network plumbers. Um, now that's changed, you mentioned software. So does, how has this definition changed? I mean, it's, a, it's always kind of, in, a, a, in terms of endearment, kind of joke, but you know, it's, it certainly is kind of plumbing, I guess. But like, with software, you mentioned the roles are changing. So what, what do you see the key change on the software side? You mentioned productivity. Is there a new discipline when you're hiring folks? Is there a new skill set? Is it uh, the same? How do you look at yeah. hiring? I mean, what do you look yeah. for? Is it in the old days, hey, good, this guy's smart, knows networks, no. is there new criteria for hiring? Yeah, so I think uh, someone that thinks outside the box differently, uh, someone who has some pro programming skills or is interested in programming skills uh, is definitely uh, appealing to sort of the next network engineer. Um, so we look for people who uh, are, you know, have uh, Python skills and stuff like that so they can actually um, uh, write sophisticated uh, code to actually uh, make changes on, on, on routers and things where so that there's less human involved, everything is getting more automated. And that's the way to scale. It's, it's interesting, there's a lot of talk here about the young guns that you guys, you know, the old, yeah. the old dogs are, are training the young guns on kind of what, what was before and it wasn't always so easy and it wasn't always just so push button. Is it, is it refreshing or is it frustrating when you got guys that, that just expect everything's going to act like like Google or LinkedIn. I mean, you guys are you guys are probably part of the problem in terms of being a really awesome and efficient application that people uh, have built their expectations around web behavior between you uh, and Amazon uh, and Facebook. You know, people expect web applications to operate like yours does. Um, is it refreshing that they just expect that, or is it frustrating because they just a lot of them don't really appreciate? Uh, either really what's happening behind the scenes and the complexity and or you guys have solved a lot right. of the, the big issues now. So in the yeah. truth the reality is they re don't really have to worry about it and they can move on to some higher value uh, yeah. items. I always think that you have to constantly reinvent yourself, right? 
in, in any any occupation. You know, you constantly have to invent yourself. And I think the people that that you know I've been doing this for 20 years. I'm, I'm still going to be on the routers. I'm not going to you know do this new SDN stuff or whatever. You know, I, I think it's just uh, one of those, uh, it's unfortunate, you know, because there's so many things that you can do when you just get out of that mode. Um, and I think it's just, the, f the future is just going to be that. I mean, I'm sorry to say that people will just have to step aside and let the new uh, sort of uh, way of thinking take over. Right? How do you do more automation? How do you do software manipulation to, to drive changes in your network? And that is the future. So we are here at the Peer 2.0 Foundation uh, event, an overall event, uh, and talking about uh, networks, LinkedIn, uh, huge uh, pressure on the network. Um, what's the number of active users now? I mean, uh, the public number, I'm not asking any confidential information. You know what the, uh, can you share any public numbers? We have uh, more than 300 million users. And, yeah. and so, you get a lot of action on the thing. One of the things that Twitter's always been kind of, you know, been holding on that rocket ship with their, their fingers holding on, not trying to get fall off with the infrastructure has been well storied, but Twitter, the fail whale, and trying to keep up with support. You guys have done a good job at LinkedIn. Um, what's your biggest lesson learned in the past three years in this growth? Um, LinkedIn has never really had any big public um, snafus like Twitter. Um, but you know, I'm sure that there's been some challenges. What have been your biggest uh, uh, learnings that you can share with the folks out there? Well, uh, keeping the site up, uh, constantly worrying about it, uh, keeping it up. Uh, that's that's uh, I think uh, every any network engineer or any network team you know cares about, and scaling and meeting the demand. Uh, that I think is is one of those things that we, we I constantly learn. I learn, uh, or my team actually learns. Uh, uh, um, you know, new things, you know, user behavior, you know, uh, patterns and things like that. So that kind of makes you think differently, you know, how do I constantly build a network to scale and, and that's the challenging, it's fun. Yeah, I love Jeff living in Silicon Valley, you get a lot of pioneers, mm -hmm. certainly, you know, when we were at, uh, based in the Cloudera office when they started years ago, Amar Awadala came from Yahoo, and a lot of the web scale companies really were pioneers in, in large scale now. On the social network side, you guys have done a great job of, of scaling up in, in, a, in a modern era, I call it, uh, a little bit later than some of the, some of the older web scale companies. Uh, but now every corporation is trying to do that. You're seeing almost like the vertical stacks, you're seeing DevOps. What is your advice to companies trying to do a LinkedIn? I'm not saying they're going to try. I mean, it's, you guys are a black swan in a way. You're, you're a, a, a unicorn or whatever you want to call it. You're not every enterprise is going to do what you guys have done, certainly from a scale standpoint, but they want to get there. Hyperscale's been a huge thing on the network side as well. So what's your advice to enterprises saying, hey, you know, I want to be more like LinkedIn. I want to be agile, I want to be fast, I want to be real time. What's your advice? Well, I, I would, you know, more probably focus on like, you know, what kind of, you know, I mean, I assume that you want to be a great content, you want to provide good content. So any company that wants to provide good content, whether it's LinkedIn, Twitter, or, or any, you know, the focus is your end user. Care more about them, like make sure that, you know, when you design products, when you design uh, infrastructure, that you're actually uh, making the end user experience as, as, as greatest as possible and that should be your only driver uh, because at the end of the day that's what matters that's what actually makes people come back to your site and, and, and be engaged so so that is like the fundamental thing that I would I would say that every DevOps or uh, infrastructure person should, should really care about is how do you make the site uh, scalable and, and stable and, 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 and provide the best end user experience. Final word for you to get the final word in for this interview. Mm -hmm. What's the, what is the Peer 2.0 event like? What is the vibe here? What's the mission? What's your takeaway? So Peer 2.0 is, um, I think, a great event uh, for uh, people who are uh, uh, a step back. So basically, peering has been, you know, uh, around for a long time, but but it's been sort of a very select group of people, small, and and people know each other. The community is very tight. Uh, but we found that, uh, some of us found that there isn't a forum where new blood can come in uh, or, or new people, or people just want to find out, you know, what is, what is peering, you know, how do we get involved or how, do, how does it benefit me? So this event is the, the, the first educational forum that actually creates uh, that atmosphere for people to come in and, 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 and just want to learn uh, that, hey, you know, how does um, Pandora do it? How does LinkedIn do it? Uh, the, you know, so we are able to share like our information on, on like how do you get in, in, involved in, in the peering community and, and, and 
and help build your site. Well, there's some big technical out. challenges to solve, some big hard problems to solve, right? And two, yeah. there's business opportunity. Right. <laughs> if you get some challenge, right? Right. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. that's great. So Jeff yeah. and I are, are covering like a blanket. We appreciate your time, Zia and Ali uh, Khan. Appreciate uh, from LinkedIn, Director of Network Engineering. Um, big job at LinkedIn, obviously great site, a great social network, we use it all the time. Um, and this is theCUBE. We're live here in Silicon Valley in Palo Alto for Pier 2.0 Foundation event. We'll be right back after this short break. <laughs>